Hello, everyone, and welcome. Welcome to today's session with uh, Mamie Fox. My name is Nellie Deutsch. People are going to be coming in as we go. Um, I'd like to remind you that uh, the chat is for you, so feel free to use the chat, ask questions, make comments as we go. You're allowed to chat because we can't hear you, so that's fine. All right, so uh, I'm going to get started. Let's see if our presenter, I see our presenter is not here yet. So uh, I'm not Mamie, I'm Nellie Deutsch, as I said, but I will be in as me in a few seconds um, as I uh, introduce the speaker. If you have any questions, uh, feel free to ask them as we go. All right, there. Okay, so uh, hi, there I am as Nellie. All right, so transpersonal. All of these live online sessions are part of the Moodle MOOC. Okay, officially we'll be uh, talking about the uh, Moodle part of uh, the MOOC tomorrow at a live online session. I also want to remind you that all these live online sessions are really, really important if you can make it. Oh, you made it. Hello, May May. So there are two of us right now, but no, there's only one May May. Um, you'll be getting badges. Everybody that attends these live online sessions will be getting a badge from Connected Educators and the U.S. Department of Education. So that's really, really exciting. A little bit about transpersonal for those of you that are not familiar with it. You'll get the hang of it, I hope, by the end of uh, the 11th presentation. It's about self-reflection, the whole person. So it's all of us, not just parts of us. It's about mindfulness, being authentic, leading from the inside out. It's about transforming, changing as uh, life goes on. Experiential and very, very personal. So that's a little bit about, a little bit, not much about it. So let's get to our presenter. Our presenter is very, very transformational. So uh, I suggest you contact her by going into uh, Google and just uh, Googling May May Fox. She has a BA in psychology, an MA in psychology, you notice from Stanford University. She's an author. She's, uh, she writes for uh, Huffington Post, and she's also edited a few books and written. She uh, not only writes, okay, she, there she is writing, and you can get all of this in the uh, courseware. Okay, a little bit about her name as a writer. She's also a yoga expert, all right? So she believes, of course, in taking care not only of her body and mind, but of the whole person. There she is. She believes that we're all more powerful than we know. So anybody can do that, okay? If you believe it, and if you, of course, practice. I wouldn't try it unless, uh, you know, you're fit. However, she says, my academic training and personal experience both have equipped me to understand the behavioral stumbling blocks, self-limiting talk, uh, that we all know about, and plain old bad habits that can get away. I'm fully prepared to help you envision and realize your dreams. All right, so May May is also a coach, a life and career coach. And uh, there's her website. You can't click here, it's not clickable, but I'll share the PowerPoint presentation with you where you can follow along now and later on and click where you need to click to get to the websites. All right, so uh, maybe I'm going to pass on the mic to you so we can get started. And I can go back to being me. Okay, and I will do that on my other computer. Okay, so let me mute my mic. Hi, good to see you. Hi. Hi, everybody. Hi, Nellie. Thanks so much for 
Beautiful introduction. That was really kind of you. So, um, hi. It's great to see. I love when everybody chats. Thank you for participating in the chat. If you're on, um, if you're on our our course today, it's really fun to see that people are tuning in from all over the world. That that just excites me so much. I think it's really one of the beauties of technology in this era is the way that it shrinks the world and we're able to come together with people in all different time zones and from all different countries. So thank you so much for, for participating. And I hope to make this uh, an interactive experience. So please pipe in and contribute whenever you, whenever you feel like it. And I'll try to pay attention to what you're saying. Um, so uh, this course is about how to find joy in your everyday life. Uh, I've embarked on, on a bit of a personal journey over the past decade, um, starting when I was uh, 30 years old and my marriage ended. So I had a, a divorce. It was really shocking to me because I never expected myself to be in that place. Um, I don't know. I think I, I had a lot of judgment, um, thinking that people who got divorced failed. And so I felt that I myself was a failure. And I, I at the same time, had a real crisis in my uh, family of origin with my father being convicted of, uh, of a crime and um, being put under house arrest for three months. And this happened at the same time that my marriage was ending. So um, I really kind of spun out into this tailspin where I questioned, you know, what is, what is life all about? And um, it, 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 this personal crisis forced me to really reconsider, you know, what is the meaning of success? What is the meaning of failure? And what is the purpose of my being here on this planet? And what I came to understand is that, you know, I've had a lot of success um, as defined from the, the external world. And, you know, I went to Stanford. I graduated top of my class. I worked at McKinsey and Company, an elite management consulting company. I've had success publishing books from a young age. But, you know, that really none of that matters. <laughs> That's, that's what I, that's a realization I came to. I mean, what matters is that we're happy and fulfilled and that we're on a path that's meaningful to us. And uh, even my failure, in quotes, with my divorce, when I kind of took years of therapy and yoga and meditation and all this, um, to understand that, that that wasn't a failure either because ultimately I was choosing myself and choosing what was authentic for me and choosing the path that was going to lead um, to my... Um, being most connected to myself and uh, as simultaneously through that, realizing that when I was happy um, in my own life, when I was happy with myself, um, that I was vastly, vastly more compassionate and able to help other people. So really it wasn't even just, you know, something that was so selfish about like, oh, I've got to lead my life and lead my journey, but it also enabled me to be of greater service to the world. So... That's just a little of my experience. In that decade, I began going to um, workshops and um, doing meditation. I did uh, three silent Vipassana meditation retreats. Uh, I did psychotherapy for several years. I also then attended graduate school to become a therapist myself and um, got a full master's degree in counseling psychology. Uh, worked for a year as a, as a therapist and under supervision and now work as a life coach. So I work directly with clients one-on-one -on -one to help them realize their dreams. I got my yoga certificate and became a yoga instructor. I did all kinds of things to um, kind of further my path um, on the journey. And uh, I, I, uh, I feel very blessed because I feel like in those 10 years, I've had a lot of struggles and suffering. And I've also really emerged on the other side with a new understanding, as I said, about the meaning of life. And to me, that is Partly um, finding joy every day. So that's what I'm here to talk to you about today is, is how to find joy in your everyday life. And I will go ahead and get started. Um, I don't, um, let's see if I can go to the next slide. Yes. So I just thought I would open with this slide. Uh, one of my favorite quotes that I've ever read, life is 10% what you make it and 90% how you take it. So that's Irving Berlin, a famous American songwriter, but uh, I think we can probably all relate to that. Um, I think one of my 
my big learnings um, during this past decade was thinking that I was in control and that um, I was setting my course in life and I was responsible for my success. I was responsible for my failures. And what I came to realize is that, in fact, uh, life is much bigger than us. We're just one little piece of it. And yes, we definitely have responsibility and need to take ownership uh, for our, you know, our piece of what we can control and what we can contribute to. We'll talk a lot about this as we go through the course. But also accepting and understanding that so much of uh, our experience of life and whether we're happy and joyful and connected and loving and appreciative it has to do with just our attitude. And that we have total control over. So that's the good news. We do have control over our attitude. And we'll talk again more about this. Mary Soul, I see you saying that you love um, that quote too. So that's great. That's terrific. So I'm going to go on. Um, actually, this is, Nelly, it was funny. You, you quoted this at the beginning. Um, but this is a mantra of mine. We have less control than we'd like, but more power than we know. Um, uh, and I just absolutely believe this to be true. So less control over what happens maybe day to day over, you know, whether we lose a job or lose a relationship or lose a loved one to death, less control over whether, you know, we get exactly what we set out to, to go after. But we have a lot of power and our power comes from our ability to control our experience of what's happening to us. And that makes us actually immensely powerful because um, we can come to understand that no matter what happens to us in life, we can still have a joyful experience. So I'm going to talk about a couple of happiness principles that I think are just kind of guidelines that we can use um, in terms of how we operate in our life. And then we'll all go into some specifics that I think are really active, specific tools that we can use to um, tap into joy in our everyday life. So uh, the first happiness principle is we have the ability to find joy and happiness inside ourselves regardless of what's going on around us. Um, and this may not always seem like the case. <laughs> I don't know if any of you want to um, chime in here and uh, share any of your experiences, but I know there are probably times all of us have felt really down and um, really hopeless or feel like the world is against us or things haven't gone our way or it's not fair or someone's hurt us or done something um, bad to us. Um, and, and, and that's always, you know, frustrating, but it, it is part of life that, that we're going to have ups and downs and positive and negative experiences. But there's always a place inside us that only we have control over, and that is uh, being able to tap into to that joy and happiness. And I really believe that we can do that every single day. So, and I think that, it, that it's extremely beneficial when we make it a daily practice and we kind of make it a habit. Um, so much of our life is determined by habits. I'm a big fan of a, a Stanford professor, B.J. Fogg, um, and I'll, I'll type his name in here to the comment section so that you guys can see it. Um, but he is, uh, he studies behavior at Stanford and, and uh, he's done some amazing, you can look him up, he has some YouTube videos and some articles. But uh, what he talks a lot about is habit formation and how much of our life experience is really just, just habit. Um, and so we can start new habits and those can really um, make a huge impact on our life. Uh, and, and they can start in a very small way. So. We'll, we'll talk some more, um, and I want to get your ideas too of habits, but one habit that I'm a big believer in is joy. So making joy a daily habit is part of what we are going to talk about today and embark on this class. So I'd like to actually switch over now and turn it over to you guys. I'd love to see a little participation here, and I'll go over to the whiteboard. Um, I wanted to share with you too. Uh, a um, blog that I wrote in January of this past year for Huffington Post where I blog about once a week 
and it was called, it was a really simple article that has, that went viral. It got some of the most likes and comments of any article I've written. And it was just called 40 Ways to Find Joy in Your Everyday Life. And it was pictures and just one-liners of things to do to find joy. And uh, I'm going to go to the whiteboard because I really would love to hear a bit from you guys of what are ways, um, let's see, I don't want to write with that tool. I don't want to write freehand, I want to write with text. So I would like to know what are some ways that you all find joy in your everyday life. And I can start with, with some of mine. Um, one of mine is, uh, number one on my list is play with kids. Um, so uh, I'm wondering if you guys have had that experience of, um, of playing with kids and just finding such joy in their joy, the way that they laugh, the way that they are creative and invent. Um, so uh, I always get a kick. I always get so much joy out of playing with kids. Another one that I have next after that is to play like a kid. So even if you don't have kids, you can still play like a kid. Um, one of the ways that I do that is uh, I'm totally a kid at heart. Like I love every time I see a swing set, if I pass by a park and I see a swing set, I go jump on the swings and I take a swing. I mean, it just gives me such a feeling like I'm flying and it reminds me of when I was young. Um, so that is a fantastic, fantastic way. Um, I just going on a playground. You don't have to be a kid and you don't even have to have a kid with you to go have some fun on a playground. Um, also, I always like take the shopping carts when I go grocery shopping and when I push them, when I'm pushing them around to, from my car to the store, I like to jump on the back and take them for a ride. <laughs> I just get a total kick out of that. So um, playing like a kid. You guys are being awfully quiet out here. See, Guadalupe said it's wonderful to be able to live with happiness and I agree completely. I know we, we have a couple people here online, um, not a huge number, but a, a few. Um, I would love for you guys to share um, what are some other ways that you find joy in your everyday life. Um, I'll keep throwing out ideas until I hear from you. Um, another big one for me is getting out in nature. Uh, just breathing fresh air, seeing the leaves on the trees, watching the clouds go by. Okay, yay, Karin contributed. Talk to my daughter. Yay, okay, I'm going to put some of your... In water activities, okay. Whoops, where did that go? Um, thank you for sharing. Play with my grandchildren, someone said. And horses, yes, animals. Oh my goodness, I'm so glad you brought that up. Um, Marisol, um, I am such, I get so much joy from animals. I was a dog owner for a long time. She recently passed away in April, but Spending time with pets is so great. Um, what else do we have here? Water aerobics, teaching. I love that. That's beautiful, Marisol, to teach as a way to find joy in life, um, right? Because you're just getting to share your knowledge and share with others. Doggy, more about pets. Also, some, also I think Marisol said learning. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, coming to a course like this, getting to learn. Um, it's so such a pleasure. Let's see, what else did I miss? Asking questions, walking in the forest, and nature, traveling. Yes, thank you for bringing that up, Karen. Um, travel, travel, so fun to have an adventure. <laughs> I love how this is coming out on the whiteboard downward. That's kind of joyful in and of itself. Um, travel so great, isn't it? How it kind of just takes you out of your everyday experience. Giving. Ah, oh, so glad that you brought that up. Kojo, giving. Yes, sharing of yourself selfishly, giving, giving joy to others. Singing in a choir. Oh, I love that. Singing in a choir is fantastic. Um, I also uh, just love to sing out loud to my radio when I'm driving in my car. Do any of you guys do that? <laughs> That's another way to sing. You don't have to be so good at it. You don't have to worry what other people are thinking about. Cooking. Ah, yeah. Karin and, uh, and Marisol agree that cooking 
Playing the guitar, yeah, making music. Um, wow, yeah, playing music, playing the guitar. And you'll notice, I'm just loving what you guys are throwing out here because you'll notice that um, none of these ideas we're talking about are so difficult. They don't necessarily require any money at all. So it's not about money. Um, and in terms of time, um, you know, learning a language, yeah, learning, great. Keep going with your ideas if you have others. But I, I, I always think it's amazing once you, once you start to really um, uh, think about um, joy and tapping into joy every day, you realize that so many of these activities we're talking about, you could spend five minutes doing them, running, yes, exercising. Oh, yeah, I'm so glad that you brought that up, exercise. For me, yoga, oh, my gosh, such joy from yoga. Um, learning languages, cool, how beautiful. Um, I would also say for me, reading. Does anybody else like to read? Reading books, novels, um, magazine articles, anything I can get my hands on. Um, exercising, absolutely. Got to make time for exercise, but it doesn't have to be so much time, right? Like, you think about it, it could just be half an hour and you could go for a nice run or a nice walk out in nature. It doesn't always have to be a huge time commitment. Um, I think uh, somebody said making music. I also really love listening to music. Um, just in the car or in the morning or sometimes when I just need a boost, I'll put on like some rowdy, uh, fun music and go dancing around my kitchen all by myself and that brings me a lot of joy. Uh, laughter. Yes, thank you Kojo for saying that. I hope you're say I'm saying your names correctly. I have no idea, but um, yes, finding things to laugh about, humor, um, everything from laughing with a friend to, you know, turning on a YouTube video, finding like a little clip of some comedian. Um, Somebody said, somebody said giving. I want to add, yeah, I want to add in the giving, um, volunteering um, or serving others. Uh, I think that um, tapping into our connection to others is a very powerful way to um, access joy in our everyday life. Um, I like to do things too. I think this is another way we can access joy uh, is give thanks. Um, and we'll talk more about this a little bit later, but, uh, you know, um, not just actually giving thanks in prayers or in gratitude for our own life, but actually verbally giving thanks to people in our lives for what they've contributed to us. So really extending that outwards. Receiving with humility. Wonderful. That is beautiful. Um, yeah, that is a really excellent point, Kojo, because I think that it can actually be challenging for us to um, to receive sometimes. We can find it challenging to receive. Oops, I don't know why this is going all over. I'm trying to stay, stay on the whiteboard. Receiving with humility, absolutely. Um, oh, where are we going? I'm on the whiteboard. Okay, maybe we're done with the whiteboard since I can't seem to get it to stay up here. I was going to see if you guys had other ideas. How about, yeah, cooking, how about eating? Um, gosh, food is a huge pleasure for me. Um, swim and cook and driving. Oh, that's nice. Thanks for sharing. Um, oh, Marty, so I love what you say here. This is harder to receive than to give. You must be whole. I love that. Um, yeah, there is something really humbling about asking others for help. And uh, I would say in general, um, both the receiving and the giving, um, and, uh, and I'll go into this a bit more again, but is connecting with others, just in general finding ways to connect. And, and receiving from others can be um, a more powerful way to connect sometimes than giving. It's, it's really amazing. People love to give, right? They want to help you. And we can get so built up with boundaries all around of uh, not, you know, not wanting to ask for help and be you know, fiercely independent. And, and then we realize, ah, it really feels good to just take help sometimes when we need it. Um, how about sleeping? Does anybody like to take naps and sleep? Oh my gosh, I feel so joyful when I've had eight hours of sleep. <laughs> um, find and enjoy little things. Yeah, I think that's that's exactly what we're talking about. We're talking about 
really a lot of little things. A lot of people are saying they love to cook here. I'm going to put swim up there. Swimming, I also love. Um, cooking, yeah, little things, right? Little things are the key. Power nap every day, great. I'm happy to see I'm not the only napper. Um, how about like watching a favorite old movie? You, are any of you guys movie fans? Do you have favorite movies that will just like always make you feel so happy to see and you'll watch them like 10 times over? <laughs> I definitely have some movies like that. Some of them are from my childhood, like uh, any John Hughes movie. I don't know if you guys know Breakfast Club and Sixteen Candles and all those from when I was a teenager. I, I just find such comfort in those. Um, Sound of Music. Oh, yes, Raul. Absolutely. Oh, that's such a great one. I used to see that every single year. Ooh, Just Sit and Relax. I'm writing that one down. Just Sit. Ugh. Yeah, meditation um, of any kind. Shawshank Redemption, great, yes. What are your, some of your favorite movies that you'd watch a hundred times over? Um, just sitting meditation, just being still and quiet. Um, do any of you guys read poetry? Is anyone a fan of poetry? Um, I, I find such joy. I have a book of, um, of Hafiz. Um, I don't know if any of you are familiar with the, the Sufi poet Hafiz or with Rumi. Um, who else do I love? Mary Oliver. Um, I'll write some of these down. Some of my favorite poets. Um, Mary Oliver is a really wonderful contemporary American poet. Um, she writes such beautiful, simple poems. Um, those are some of my favorite poets. When I sit down and relax, I knit. Mm, knit and read poetry once in a while. How beautiful. I'm going to put knitting on here. Knitting. That's, it's such a quiet, introspective kind of uh, um, way to find joy. You know, I, And I think that's actually a really critical point is that joy, it doesn't have to be big and loud and out there and like crazy. It can be. You know, like it can be a big raucous party with our whole family where everybody's eating and celebrating and it's someone's birthday or a wedding, but it can also be very quiet and peaceful and solitary. And it can be just a really quiet moment of tapping into our own heart. Um, I also, here's another one. Maybe you guys haven't thought, this is a childlike too, but I love getting messy sometimes, you know, like either um, like getting messy through um, uh just running in the mud and like letting my shoes just get coated in mud or um, getting a little dirty or playing with a kid and running through the sprinklers. Um, I think it's good to get dirty sometimes, you know, and just kind of let ourselves go. Um, how about watching a sunrise or sunset? Are any of you uh, fans of sunrises and sunsets? Oh my gosh, I find any single time that I watch a sunrise or a sunset and just so swept up in, in the joy and power of the moment in the beach and in the mountains in particular yeah it's just there's something like really so incredibly poetic and beautiful how about snuggling is anyone else a fan of snuggling <laughs> you live up in the andes mountains maria so wow how lucky are you i bet you have gorgeous sunrises and sunsets um as we do here in Los Angeles at the beach, I, I can often make it out there for a sunset. Um, and so snuggling, anyone a fan of snuggling with pets, with kids, with loved ones, just like that human touch, feeling that embrace and the warmth, oh, so joyful. Um, there, there are a lot, of, a lot more ideas um, with my grandchildren, dog and cat, listen to music, giving thanks, making music, wonderful. Oh, the rain. Yeah, thanks for bringing up the rain. I love watching the rain. I love walking in the rain. Rain is so peacefully joyful, isn't it? So these are wonderful. Thank you all so much for contributing. I'm, I'm glad we took a little time to talk about all the different ways that we find joy every day and tap into joy every day. As I said, just looking at this list, it's, it's a great reminder. It doesn't have to take a ton of time. It doesn't have to cost any money. It can really be appreciating what we already have and we're already connecting with every single day, but just making it a little more conscious, bringing more awareness to it. 
So um, I'm going to go back to my, um, oh, if we could go back to the slideshow now. So thanks so much for contributing, Singing in the Rain. <laughs> great. I love that movie. That movie is so fun and joyful. It's a great suggestion. Find, join Caring for Plants, another great idea. Yeah, it's a nice way of connecting. All right, so um, the second happiness principle that I wanted to share with you guys is that everything is impermanent. So uh, here's a trap that I think that a lot of us can get ourselves into. When we start to think about happiness, happiness sounds kind of more like a state of being. And so we can get fooled into thinking that, you know, if we're, you're either a happy person or a sad person. And um, I really um, urge you to um, appreciate the fact that all of these emotions of happiness, sadness, joy, um, they're so temporary, you know, they're fleeting. And, and I think that it actually liberates us and it takes a lot of the pressure off because it's like we're not after this unattainable goal of happiness. And like it makes it sound like it's something out there on the mountaintop, like we're hiking towards it and someday I'll be happy. You know, someday I'll get to the top of that mountain. And it's not. It's like, it's like you know, you're already there and the happiness is all around you. So the joy is all around you. And it's just a matter of like bowing down and plucking that flower, or taking that moment to appreciate. Um, that the joy is right there, and it's right in front of you, and it's all around you. And you may have it for a moment, and then it may slip away, and you may go, you know, we all have bad days too. We all have bad times, times when we're depressed and upset or something really awful happens, and that it's okay to let that in too. So, um, you know, um, there's, this, there's this great uh, passage by Khalil Gibran in his book, The Prophet, uh, where he talks about how, you know, we can't, we can't have joy without sorrow. I'm going to write this down. Um, we just, we can't, so we can't have joy without sorrow. So instead of fighting against the moments of sadness, we welcome them in. And I think that that is, seems kind of maybe counterintuitive to some people, but in, as part of being joy champions and a part of finding joy in our everyday life, we need to also really welcome the sadness and the hardship and the depression and the anger in too and realize that they're just, they're all part of the human experience. And you know what, that, that angry feeling is going to come and go, the sad feeling is going to come and go, the joyful feeling is going to come and go. What we have a choice about is looking for those moments of joy and trying to make a habit out of finding them every day and multiple times a day. Um, so it's really great to have this, this reconnection with the idea of impermanence and just see life as coming, going, and passing. So that's a happiness principle that I wanted to share with you. Okay, we talked a little bit about this at the beginning, but another happiness principle is that your reaction is your choice or some... Buddhists, uh, I've done a lot of Buddhist meditation. I'm not a Buddhist myself, but I do really love the philosophy of Buddhism. And that is that, you know, we, um, we kind of, like things happen to us and we tend to have this very automatic, instantaneous reaction, right? And so, you know, if somebody says something that offends us, then we get upset and we get defensive and we want to come to, to our ego. And, uh, and, and I think... Um, you know, we, we, we may allow that to happen, but what we can do, and, and meditation helps a lot with this, is just create a bit of space between our reaction and when we actually, you know, do something about it. So what they say in Buddhism is we can't, you know, we, we can control our response. And by responding rather than reacting, it just indicates that we're taking a little bit more time. The Bible, too. So yes, your reaction is your choice. So you, 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 you kind of have this automatic reaction, especially when something upsets us or something is. But if we just create a little space to be the observer and to let ourselves come in and see what is going on and say, okay, well, you know, is there another way of interpreting what's happening right now? So is there a way of, instead of getting angry or upset, um, is there a way of saying, hey, you know, 
maybe I can have compassion for this person who just insulted me. Maybe they actually are having a really bad day. Maybe somebody just laid them off or broke up with them or something terrible happened to them. And so we just, we create a little bit of distance. And I think what that allows us is this awareness that, you know, we don't have to instantly get tripped up. So in, into a cycle of, of getting angry or getting upset. Um, and we might find a little bit of peace there in that space, in that distance. Um, it is, it's really challenging. You see some of you commenting, it's, it's difficult, it's hard. Um, but, uh, I, but I do believe that, that we, I, you know, I think there's room for all emotions. So I don't want to say like, oh, don't get angry or don't get upset because I was just talking about how important it is to allow all emotions. But we can have that emotion and then we can give ourselves a little bit of awareness of what is going on. And I think that that awareness provides a little more space. The space between stimulus and response, Stephen Covey. Yes. Um, yeah, Kojo. That is, uh, that is what I, I find is the case. Um, well, this is generating some interesting discussion, so I'm really glad that you guys are participating and, and, and have your own thoughts and feelings about this. Um, so I, uh, I, and I welcome you to continue commenting as well. So I wanted to share some actual practices with you, what I have found to help me access joy every day. These are some actual implementable practices. Um, the first is to be present. So, you know, um, we spend so much of our lives uh, past and thinking about the future. So we, we often are tripping out on what happened to us before and, you know, what got us to where we are today. And then we're looking towards the future, you know, projecting, planning, making goals, saying, okay, I need to get here, I need to get there. And I'm so glad, Luciano, you asked, be present. How? Which is a great question, um, because there is the idea of being present, and there's the being present. For me, uh, I would say the most powerful tool of my life that I have discovered for being present is meditation. And you can meditate within any tradition. It is not a religious practice, but it is rather a spiritual practice. It doesn't even have to be tied to any religion. Um, there's wonderful mindfulness-based stress reduction, MBSR, that's taught in Western psychology. Um, you may have heard of... Um, so, yeah, Luciana, you're asking how to be present, so I'm talking about that now. Uh, what I find is the greatest key to being present is meditation. Um, now, I'm going to share with you a little bit about my own journey with meditation. You can take it or leave it. But what I did is uh, I tried many times to meditate, and I just found that um, I wasn't good at it at all. I actually really sucked at it. Um, I would just lose my attention and focus. I would shuffle. I would look at the watch. I couldn't sit for more than 10 minutes. And uh, I, Maria Sol, I like you, I felt like, oh, this just isn't for me. You know what? I'm not a meditator. I go too fast. My mind is always going, and it's not going to happen for me. Then I heard from several friends about um, something called Vipassa meditation. And I'm going to share the website with you as well. It's www.dhamma.org. This is the particular program that I did. It, it does come from the Buddhist um, kind of spiritual tradition, but it is not religious. There's no attempt to convert you or make you Buddhist, or you can be Christian, you can be Jewish, you can be Muslim, you can be anything, and you can go to this class. And it was 10 days. I called it meditation boot camp, and it was the hardest thing I have ever done in my life. Um, no doubt, I was not allowed to, you're not allowed to read, listen to music, journal, um, nothing. You basically sit for something like 14 hours a day and meditate. Uh, and it was really, really hard. The first day I was there, I almost vomited. I was so kind of agitated, but I, I really committed to doing it. And I'm so glad I did because by day four, my mind started to slow down. And I had told myself this story my whole life for 35 years that, you know, I wasn't a meditator. I couldn't slow down. That just wasn't my personality. I'm so going to it. I'm always like planning. Um, and it was beautiful. It was the most beautiful experience of my life when my mind slowed down after four days of silent meditation with no talking, no reading, no writing, no music, no distractions, just me and my cushion and one hour lecture every night. Um, 
it, it was totally transforming. By day eight, I had really reached a blissed out spiritual state. Like I was just kind of in direct contact with God. I felt like um, I had a, a true um, religious experience in terms of connecting with other beings. I felt so connected to all human beings on the planet and all life on the planet, animals, even bugs and trees. I saw trees as living beings and it was so profound. And Marie Soul saying that might be good for you. Yeah. I, I, and I tell you, there was something about the 10 days. There was something about sitting through the discomfort, through the struggle, and coming out the other side and realizing that, yeah, all we have is now. This is it. And so now I meditate every day. Sometimes I do sitting meditation. Um, the best part I just wanted to say, finish up my thing about the Vipassana course, is that it was a 10-day course, food, lodging, teaching, free, free of charge. It's no cost. And it exists everywhere in the world. There are Vipassana meditation centers in every country in the world. And you can just sign up and you can go and you can have this incredible experience. So I'm just going to recommend that to you. Take it or leave it. But it changed my life. I've done three Vipassana meditation retreats and each one has been so profound. And I've really carried meditation into my daily life because of this aspect of being present. I find that um, a lot of my unhappiness... Uh, a lot of happiness is just is just connecting to right now, to realizing, you know, I'm upset about something that happened to me a long time ago, or I'm worried about something that hasn't happened to me yet. That's like some projection that I have of what's going to happen in the future. But if I'm right here now, I'm in my body, I'm breathing, I'm looking at the trees, I'm listening to the birds, I'm listening to music, I'm petting my cat or my dog, I'm, I'm walking along the water, watching a sunset, you know, whatever it may be, and being present to what is here right now in this very moment, it's often usually very joyful. It just is. So yeah, so now I meditate every day. Sometimes I sit, sometimes I walk. I do a lot of silent walking meditation. Um, but that is happiness practice one. And thank you for, for listening to that. Um, another happiness practice is um, accepting things as they are. So I love this serenity prayer from, um, they recite this in, in AA Alcoholics Anonymous here in, in the U.S. I don't know if you guys from other countries are familiar with this, but the serenity prayer goes like this. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Kojo says, I love this running part. I love it too. It's just, it just encapsulates everything, right? It's, it's everything about the joy practice for me. It's saying, you know, it's accepting the fact that there are things I cannot change and, and, and making peace with that. But then also knowing, yeah, but there are things that I can change. So I'm not going to just hand over all responsibility for my life and say, you know, oh, well, I don't have a choice in anything that happens to me. You don't want to be passive, right? You're an active participant in your life. So what do you actually have the power to change? And being able to discern, you know, what I can change, what I can't. So if I can change it, then am I going to make the effort to change it? You know, I've, if I can change something, I have three choices. One is I get on a horse and I start riding into that change and I go full speed ahead and I say, I'm going to change this situation. Or the other is that I just choose to accept it. And there are other things we can't change. We have no choice but to accept them. If somebody dumps us, if somebody leaves us through death, we don't have a choice about that. I lost my my puppy of my doggy of 12 years um, last spring, and I was devastated. But that's not something that I had a choice about. So you know, then I think what we do is yeah, is exactly what Kojo just said: is we surrender and we say, you know, that's something I don't have a choice over. What do I do? I do have a choice over is my reaction. Like I talked to you earlier about my reaction is my choice. You guys said emotions are difficult. I agree. And it's not saying don't have a negative reaction, a negative reaction. I'm not even sure that exists. Let yourself have your emotions. You know, um, uh, uh, there's this beautiful, beautiful poem by Rumi where he says, this human being is a guest house. Do you guys know that poem? This human being is a guest house by Rumi. Um, he says, you know, we have all these emotions. Welcome them in. Even the anger may be clearing away our this, you know, our home for a new delight. Um, so, I, you know, I let those emotions come in, let them have their way with me, 
but eventually I know they're going to pass and I'm going to come back to this place of serenity and peace and joy. And I'm going to come back to this place of looking for joy. Um, there, are there are 12 steps in AI, I know, um, and this, this poem is just so powerful and so meaning, meaningful. Um, if anybody wants to find that human being as a guest house poem, I, I welcome you to find it and post it, and we could do a quick search for it. Okay, I truly believe that gratitude is the queen of all emotions. Uh, I don't think that... Um, that we can over overdo it when it comes to gratitude. Um, I, I really, uh, I really tap into gratitude every single day, and this is a habit. So there are many ways that you can make gratitude a habit, and I think one way, a very simple way, is to start a gratitude journal. Um, I'm going to write that down too. Um, you can keep a little journal, like maybe next to your bed or maybe in your kitchen somewhere where you're going to see it every single day. And, uh, or you can do it, I have actually I also have an iPhone app on my phone called the Gratitude app. So I sometimes I track it in my phone when I'm out in the battle, snap a picture of something. And I try to write down five things every day that I'm grateful for. And I think um, Mary still said start your day. Um, I think that's one way to do it. I think you could start your day with a gratitude practice. You can end your day with a gratitude practice, or you can do both. So whatever kind of fits best into your life. Um, but uh, it's just another form of prayer. It's a form of giving thanks to God for our life here on this planet, and a thanks to all the people who make our life beautiful. So I find my gratitude journal, it can be you know, something really simple, like a beautiful flower, Kojo says, I've been keeping a gratitude journal since 2005. Wow, that's so amazing. I think it must be so incredible for you to go look at that, huh? And just see um, for like eight, nine years now what you felt grateful for. Um, sometimes it's people, you know, it's my, sometimes my husband or my mom or a best friend who's done something lovely. Sometimes it's, it's the sunset. Um, or it's a little snuggle with my doggy. You can see, you can see her here in this picture. If you look closely, that's my that's my doggy Masala who passed this spring. I missed her. But gratitude, and, and it does. It helps in the down moments. It helps in the positive moments too. I think expressing gratitude even when we're up and things are going great and we're like on fire, it's great to remember like, okay, well, part of this is my doing, but part of this is is luck and good fortune and blessings, and so. You know, it keeps us humble. So it's funny that it, it, it helps in both ways, I find, gratitude. So I really recommend a gratitude uh, journal or some people pray. Um, you can pray every night and just give thanks. I just got back from three weeks in Uganda where I was volunteering with a nonprofit called Uganda Project and making short films for them to help them raise money. And I was hanging out with these 12 Ugandan young people who've been sponsored to go to school by Americans who are paying their way, which is awesome. Uh, these kids wouldn't get to go to school otherwise. It costs too much for them to go to school in Uganda. And what I was so moved with, we lived together with them for three weeks in a compound, is that they prayed together before every meal. They would join hands before every meal and just say, you know, Lord, we thank you for this food, for the hands that prepared it. Um, and you know, then thank you for being together and this new family. Oh my gosh, I was so moved. I really took that home with me. My husband and I have now been saying a prayer before every dinner, uh, and really doing our best to make this a habit. You know, talk about a daily habit. Um, Marisol says that was my dream, but did not go, did not do it when it was time. Hmm. Okay. Well, yeah, it's, it's, uh, that's another thing is service. But we tend to focus on the negative more readily. The gratitude journal helps to keep an attitude of gratitude. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more, Kojo. Thank, thank you for sharing. You guys are so great. I really appreciate your participating. Another happiness practice for me and that I think is um, probably neglected quite a bit in American culture. I don't know about in your culture. Um, Karin, you've had a powder outage. Are we going to lose you? I'm so sad if we lose you. I've really appreciated your contributions. Um, so thanks for your compliment. I look pretty in that picture. That was on the beach in San Francisco when I lived up there. It's a gorgeous place. But um, foster mind-body-soul connection, okay? I, I think that we can get very heady 
about um, our lives and controlling them and planning and, you know, wanting things to be different. But, you know, a lot of it is also staying connected to our bodies. So I think we can easily get so busy that we stop paying attention to our bodies and we don't eat as well, we don't exercise. And you guys all talked earlier about exercising. People were talking about walking and swimming and dancing. It's so important to get in our bodies and move and be connected with our mind, body, soul alignment. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's really a powerful way to get out of our heads and into our bodies. So yoga is great for me. I also love hiking. I don't know what you guys have done, some surfing in my life, whatever it is. But to making sure you take some time to take care of your body. Um, because all the research shows that people who exercise regular are happier and um, have fewer anxieties and uh, it has all kinds of benefits, not just to our physical health like our heart rate and our blood pressure, but actually to our mental health. Okay, you know, we really take comfort in community and uh, our connection is to others as well as to ourselves. So once I think we get in the habit of, of taking care of ourselves and finding happiness within us, then we can really begin to reach out and extend our gratitude practice, our happiness practice, and decide to become joy champions and share that energy with others. And uh, Mari Soul says, when I was a little girl, I remember a song that said body and soul. I thought it said Mari Soul, Maria Soul, my name. That's awesome. I love it. Body and soul. Maria soul. Um, so uh, connecting authentically with others. And the biggest lesson I've learned in the past decade through my own personal journey and a lot of struggles is that it is okay to be vulnerable. In fact, it's more than okay. It is necessary to have authentic connections with others to be vulnerable. And I actually adopted this mantra called lead with your vulnerability. So what I find is when I'm meeting someone new or with a, whether I'm connecting with an old friend, um, when I am open about uh, what's really going on for me, so not trying to present a beautiful picture of how perfect any, everything in my life is, but, um, but to be real and be like, you know, this is going great. I'm so grateful for my incredible husband, for this beautiful place that I live for the work that I have right now. Um, at the same time, you know, um, I, I have worries and struggles. I'm worried right now about health insurance, for example, and <laughs> that's a whole other conversation. But, you know, there are things that I'm stressing. So lead with our vulnerability, Maria, that's all I'm trying to explain right now, is sharing what's real for us, sharing not only what, you know, what we're succeeding with, but also what we're struggling with. And I think that takes courage, and we're very much trained, at least in American culture. I don't know about in your cultures, but in American culture, we're really trained um, to uh, put on an act and show how great and wonderful and awesome our lives are. But uh, but there 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 is, and there's this great Brene Brown TED Talk that I'm in, that I'm gonna also Brene Brown TED Talk on vulnerability. I really recommend you all to watch this if you want to understand vulnerability together. It's just not being afraid to to be courageous in talking about the the stuff that's challenging you and that's hard for you. And what I found, like when I was going through my divorce a decade ago, and then the years subsequent, um, and my family was also you know in crisis, is is that, uh, oh my gosh, contrary to my belief that people were going to judge me or view me as a failure, it was the opposite. The more real I was, the more authentic I was, the more people opened up to me and wanted to share their own struggles and trials. And then suddenly we were having this connection that was on so much of a deeper level. You know what I mean? It just, it, it just cut through all the nonsense. Yeah, Kojo, I really appreciate your sharing. Um, yeah, about authenticity and vulnerability. So, oh, thank you, Dr. Nelly. I appreciate your sharing the TED Talk link. Thank you. I was going to go find that. Okay, so another happiness practice we just started to dive into, but I'm sure you all have ideas for how to do this, is to volunteer, be of service to others. This was me volunteering in Haiti about a month after the earthquake there in 2010, 
every year I try to take a big volunteer trip. Um, what are some of the ways that you guys do service? You can work in a soup kitchen. You can volunteer at your kid's school. You can um, bake a meal for a neighbor who's older or who's sick and take it to them. I mean, there's so many ways that you can give back. And what I find is like living is so much richer when we're giving. I have this friend who talks about living by giving. And I wanted to share with you that psychological research shows that people who volunteer lead longer, happier lives. They actually experience fewer bodily aches and pains. Can you believe that? And they say, the experts say that serving others, volunteering, has more has a, as powerful an impact on our well-being as exercising, going to church, and quitting smoking. Kojo teaches literacy. Yes, you must begin with yourself. That's why the whole first half of this quote, this uh, course, was on was on taking care of yourself, right? But once you've taken care of yourself, go out and take care of others. And uh, now, living by giving is genius, isn't that? My friend is writing a whole book about that. Um, thanks for all your ideas. My last happiness practice is fear less, love more. So I find that um, so often in life we trip ourselves up and slow ourselves down with fear. We react from a place of fear. What what would what you know? What could happen? Happen if I quit my job, leave this relationship that is making me happy? You know, make a change, move to a different place. Um, you know, try to follow my my heart. Um, Kojo teaches adults and kids through my church of school literacy program. How awesome! That's fantastic. Um, so I really I really believe in trying to not get rid of fear because fear does serve an important part in our lives. I and mean, there's a reason for fear. There are things we should be afraid of, like we shouldn't do crazy things, like jump off of bridges. But um, the way to fear less, love more for me. Is it's a daily practice. It's like a, it's a joy practice. It's a gratitude practice. Um, so uh, for me, overcoming fear, it has been a very deliberate effort. I have made a deliberate effort to go after and do things that make that scare me, that make me afraid. Um, not huge things, like I said, like not like jumping off a cliff or something. But I will, you know, I, I went to Haiti to volunteer a month after the earthquake. I was a little scared of that, and I went and did it. Um, and what I think it is, is it's coming down to a place where I say, am I making this choice out of fear or am I making this choice out of love? So if I'm making the choice out of love, great. If I'm making the choice out of fear, then I have to really look at that and say, is this, you know, is this a fear I want to listen to or is this an irrational fear? And I think the truth of the matter is 99% of the time in life, when we are making a choice from fear, it is not a rational fear. It's something we think might happen. And it's really fundamentally a fear of embarrassing ourselves or a fear of, fear of failure. So that's what I challenge you to look at. Is this a fear of failure? Is this a fear of embarrassing myself? Because when you really think about it, what's the worst that can happen most times when we're talking about taking a risk? It is, oh my God, I'm going to fail. I'm going to mess up. People are going to think I'm a failure. And you know what? Even if you do fail, failure isn't that bad. Failure in my life is the reason I am here today. It's the reason why I have a joy practice. It's the reason why I'm reaching out, trying to be a joy champion and educate others is because of the failures that I've suffered and having to look at that and say, what is the real point of life? Um, and that to me is to fear less and love more. So um, whether it's you know starting a new business, speaking in front of a crowd, you know, reaching out and saying I love you to someone, giving thanks. Um, there's so many ways that we can fear less and love more. And nice ideas in the chat too. Yes, thank you. You guys are awesome. You're coming. I love false evidence appearing real. Wow, that is so awesome. And Maria Sol, a widow of 41 with four children. Wow. Wow. Um, and Dr. Nelly says fear can be embraced. That's true. We can, you know, we can harness it. Um, Sometimes it gives us great energy to encourage to make change, right? Um, so that can be powerful as well. Um, well, you guys are so full of great ideas. I feel like you've taught me um, as much, if not more, than what I've taught you. Um, thank you for all of your uh, participatory remarks. And I really appreciate it. It was great speaking with you all today. Um, so lots of love to all of you. God bless. May you be joyful. Go out and that spread the so joy wonderful. with others. Thank you, Thank you. so much. Thank you, Maymay. That that.
that is, you know, that's something that we have to continuously hear. And, and I'm so grateful that uh, May May was able to uh, come and uh, speak to us so that we can be reminded that we can do it. Okay, each one of us um, can be happy if we choose. You know, and that's kind of scary sometimes. Uh, but yeah, we can. So I'd like to thank everyone uh, for joining us. Maybe I see that you uh, muted your mic and you took away your webcam. You don't have to. Yeah. <laughs> you don't have to step out. Well, it, you know, I don't have to. Oh, here I am. I've got Hi. lots of space here. <laughs> I was trying to make space for you. <laughs> it's like you do over there. <laughs> All right, so I'd like to, yeah, I'd like to thank you <laughs> and May May for joining us. And it's really about learning together. So I know, I know. Just learning from one another. Oh, there's no question. And yeah, I really appreciate how everybody shared their own insights and wisdom. That's my favorite part of doing these the courses. Same thing. We're, we're exactly the same. <laughs> Different stories, same feeling, same mind, chattering, you know. So we're not alone. So true. <laughs> All right, so have a wonderful day and thank you. Thank you so much. Yes. Thank you again. And bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, you guys have a wonderful day too. And thanks again, Nelly. Bye bye.